Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'm at the Middletown Anglers and Hunters Gun Club. And uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with some road noise here. Probably some shooting noise as things get going, but definitely some road noise because the Pennsylvania Turnpike is right on the other side of that berm. So it kind of kills the 18th century ambiance a little bit. But I needed to come out here instead of the solitude of Duelist End because I wanted the length of range that this club provides. And you'll see why as we get going. Because today what I want to look at is an experiment I've wanted to do for a while. I'd like to see how effective a civilian smoothbore in the hands of either militia or a backwoodsman would have been in the middle of the 18th century. So say the French and Indian War, you know the Seven Years War, uh, starting in 1754, if you go from Washington uh, causing all the ruckus, or the American War for Independence. Because in both of those conflicts, the militia would have been more likely to be armed with a smoothbore like this than they would have been to be armed by a rifle. Uh, in fact, rifles really did not come into any prominence at all in the colonies until the Seven Years' War. And they were quite rare at the beginning of the war. In fact, the Seven Years' War probably accelerated the rifle culture in the middle colonies. But even so, you would have had mostly smoothbores to start things out. And even by Pontiac's Rebellion, there would still have been probably more smoothbores and rifles being used out in the backwoods. Uh, certainly in the New England colonies, smoothbores would have been the gun of choice for the entire 18th century. And let's remember that the New England colonies were where most of the war had been occurring before the Seven Years' War. So the New England colonies had been fighting the Indians in one way or another, uh, since the, 17, uh, the 1650s, and they'd been fighting the French since the end of the 17th century. So they just wrapped up two wars before the Seven Years' War started. So frontiersmen in New England were the experienced Indian fighters in the colonies at the time particularly the men who lived in New Hampshire and Maine, uh, western Massachusetts and northwestern Connecticut. Uh, those, those were the people that were fighting Indians all the time. And by the time the revolution rolled around, the senior folks, you know, the guys in their 40s who had leadership positions, had mostly been blooded during the French and Indian War. And mostly they were using civilian smoothbores. So the question is, how far away could you be with a civilian smoothbore that a militiaman would be carrying, as opposed to a military smoothbore which is loaded quite differently and trained quite differently? How close could you be and be effective? And how far away could you be and still be effective? Those, those are the questions. And um, I know I'm doing a lot of talking here, but you know, you can break down 18th century warfare in America into two main types. There's the European style open battlefield conflict, and there's the American deep woods conflict. And uh, the Seven Years' War saw both of those types though early on it was mostly the American backwoods type conflict and not the European type conflict, but there, there were those as well against fortresses like Ticonderoga or the Plains of Abraham. So there were some opportunities, but you had the Battle of the Monongahela, uh, you had the uh, Battle of Lake George, you had numerous battles and skirmishes all throughout the war that were fought in American backwoods style by the militia, uh, mostly using smoothbores. And then the European style relied on linear tactics, 
where you would have mass fire. I know, that road is very loud, so I hope you can hear me over it. Uh, you relied on linear tactics and mass fire. So what would happen is armies would line up opposing each other. One of them might be fortified or they might both be in the open. Uh, they'd march towards each other and they would fire one or two massed volleys of all the troops firing at once. And a great example of that on the American side would be the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, where John Stark with his New Hampshire boys, he actually went out and staked out positions 40 and 50 yards ahead of, uh, of his redoubt so that his guys would know when the enemy was within range because they didn't want to shoot at them farther than 50 yards out because the idea was to have one volley all at the same time that would be devastating to your opponents that would hit them with so much shock that would drop so many men that it would stop the charge they would turn around and run away. Uh, that was the hope. Now, I'm going to tell you, in 18th century warfare, battlefields were chaotic and frightening. And that's the case in all warfare, but in the 18th century might have really taken the cake. Because tactics required troops to march in line, out in the open, under cannon fire and musket fire, where people were dropping left and right all around them, to get to within range to finish things off with a bayonet charge. That was a British doctrine. And if you were a battlefield commander, the way you won a battle was by having trained troops and by using the terrain properly and exercising good leadership and judicious tactics. But if you were a foot soldier, the way you survived an 18th century battle was purely based on luck. Just luck. Because you were standing right out there with hundreds of guys all shooting in your direction. And you had to pray that none of those balls found their way, either on purpose or accidentally, into your body. <laughs> and that no cannonballs did either. And believe me, that was 100% a matter of luck. So, if you were standing in that line, you knew that your chances of being dead were excellent. And only by the grace of God were you going to get to the point where you could use your skill with a bayonet to finish the fight. That's quite different from earlier fights, say medieval shield and sword fights, uh, where the individual warrior's skill had a great deal to do with him surviving the battle. Right? In an 18th century battle, your skill didn't come into play until you were in contact with the enemy. So you might be covering 100 or 200 yards or more of open field with cannonballs plowing your guys up, and then when you're close enough with musketry plowing your guys up. So, I'd like to see how effective that musketry is. That's what we're going to do today. We're, we're going to use Tommy Target here, and uh, we are going to see how well we can hit him. I'm going to start at 50 yards. 50 yards would have been pretty much point-blank range for an 18th century battle. And, and I'll tell you, when we're at the firing line, this target is not going to look big as something to shoot at. But a person out here 50 yards away who is going to be trying to do you harm that seems remarkably close 50 yards is like no separation at all it's going to be bang charge and you're fighting uh, quite a frightening proposition but let's start off at 50 and see how we do and we're going to be loading with bare balls and I'm going to explain that in a minute because it's actually pretty important so let's go back to the firing line. Okay, today's shooting is going to be done with uh, 18th century civilian smoothbore loading techniques. And specifically what that means is we will not be using patch balls. Uh, these days, smoothbores are most often shot with patch balls just like rifles are. The only difference is in matches is that smooth boards are not allowed to have a rare sight. Though in the 18th century, quite a few of them did have rare sights, so go figure. But uh, people today tend to shoot 
small charges of 3F and patch balls, just like rifle shooting. And, you know, I do think that's the most accurate way to shoot these, but it's not the way they shot them in the 18th century. And therefore, shooting them that way today is not going to prove anything about the effectiveness of 18th century militia troops. So we're going to load them the way they would have been loaded in the 18th century. And most militia would not have used paper cartridges. That would have been used more by professional soldiers. These are guys, like say the Minutemen, who got called up out of their homes. They muster with their own weapons that they use for hunting or for protection uh, against Indians. And the way they would have loaded them with ball would have been to load powder from the horn, to load a loose ball, just like this, on top of the powder, and to wad it with some wadding material. Now I'm using cut up blanket pieces to do that. Uh, that's a legitimate 18th century wad. Probably toe would have been more common, cut paper, even, even felt. Uh, I use toe a lot, but I've gotten away from it, particularly this summer because it's been extremely hot and extremely dry and toe tends to catch the foliage on fire. So even though on this range I could probably get away with it, uh, I'm gonna use the blanket pieces. All right, so the ball goes down bare and there's no patch to keep it centered to make it shoot true. Uh, the theory is that basically the firing charge surrounds the ball uh, almost with a cushion of plasma that keeps it centered down the ball and out, out, down the bore and out where it's going. So that's the technique that we're going to use today to shoot. So we'll see how that does. Okay, we're going to start off at 50 yards. We've got our, our target. Uh, I'm going to fire five shots. And uh, I'm going to load and prime from the horn. I'm going to use the same 2F powder to prime as I'm using to shoot. I'm going to be shooting a load of 110 grains of 2F Swiss. Uh, I know that seems like a heavy load, but heavy loads were the norm for bare balls. And it is 2F, which has a little less velocity than 3F. Uh, and in fact, 2F would have been the best powder used in one of these smooth bores. A lot of them would have been shot with 1F. Uh, 2F was generally reserved for rifles. So let's take five shots at 50 yards and see how we do. And, you know, like I said before, that 50 yard target seems like a ways off for shooting at. But if that guy was going to break into a run at me with a bayonet, he would seem very close indeed. So let's load up and get to shooting.
All right, that's five shots. See how we did. All right, so at 50 yards, we're 100% deadly. And uh, I'm gonna just cover these. All right, so at 50 yards, every shot's a kill. Um, so we know that works. So let's move it back now to 100 yards. And we'll try that again. All right, our target's set up now 100 yards downrange. That's a slightly more comfortable distance if you uh, figure that that guy might be a Native American with a tomahawk who's going to come chasing after you. Uh, now, of course, most of our militiamen would have been young active fellows, not senior citizens, uh, you know, fat senior citizens like myself with weak eyes, so they probably would have done better. But uh, 100 yards is a distance that most guys are going to want to start shooting at, and a lot of commanders know that. And, you know, in some battles like uh, Guilford Courthouse or uh, Cowpens, where you've got a commander who understood the militia, what he would ask him for is two fires, shoot twice, and then run away, and uh, the regulars will come in and take over, but uh, put two rounds into them. And that generally meant starting about there at 100 yards, some guys would even start shooting a little bit farther, and try to get one in at 100, and one in as they're closing within 50, and then fade back and let the Continental Line take over. Now, during the French and Indian War, when you had forest warfare, the doctrine is kind of like European skirmishing. Uh, American militia would generally work in pairs, and they would get behind trees. And this is something that Braddock just could not understand. He would whip guys into line when the Indians just killed them. Right? But militiamen would get behind trees, one would fire and one would stay loaded. And that way, after you fired, if the Indian you were shooting at rushed you, your partner could take him out while you were loading. So you always had one gun loaded. Now, when you were alone in the woods in an Indian fight, everybody got behind a tree, and you tried to get a shot at the other guy without wasting your shot. Because if you wasted your shot, he was coming at you, and what you had to do was go hand to hand. Uh, which was not always a pleasant prospect. So, 100 yards would not have been an uncommon shot. What we don't know is, is it an effective shot? And that's what we're going to find out now. So let's load up and uh, see how we do at 100 yards. Okay, I'm not going to lie, that does not seem like much to aim at. Even though if that was a person there, 100 yards would still feel too close for comfort for me. <laughs> if they were shooting back. Well, let's see how we did. Okay, I didn't do as well at 100 yards, but to be honest with you, this is pretty good. So I've got one miss, but man, it's not a miss by much. So that was pretty close. I've got one that went through his cuff that would not have hurt him. So we got two that would have been misses. But we've got three good ones right in here. So, considering how close these are, the odds are that at 100 yards, a good militia fighter is going to hit his man. He's going to hit his man more times than not. And now I think we ought to back this guy up. 
But we're set up now 125 yards out, and the distance is starting to feel significant. Uh, I've got to apologize, this is the noisiest place on earth between the Pennsylvania Turnpike and the Harrisburg International Airport. The noise is terrible, but I needed the 200 yard range, so I hope it doesn't ruin the video. So let's go 125 yards, see if that's an effective musket shot. at 125 let's see how we did well, just to recap our little experiment to see how how effective this is a civilian smoothbore fouling piece uh, as a militia item what's the effective long range of it and at least for me a 65 year old fat man with bad eyes the effective range is 100 yards <clears throat> Uh, the tail of the tape is blue equals 50, orange equals 100, black equals 125. So at 50 yards, all in the vitals. At 100 yards, 3 out of 5 in the vitals. And then at 125 yards, total miss. That's no good. Now, a young frontiersman, young, active, good eyes, uh, making his living outdoors, Maybe he could stretch it to 125 or even 150 where I could. But uh, I would say 100 is where I'd feel safe at. So that's a lot better than most people think a musket can do, especially with a bare ball. Uh, for people who think you can't hit a barn from the inside with one of these unpatched, well, you can see at 100 yards, I would not feel safe with somebody shooting one of these at me. So, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know the drill, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. Support us on Patreon if you'd like to. And until next week, I'll see you.